Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us for tonight's Master Gardener program. We're very excited to hear all about how we can attract some of those uh, small but mighty and feisty birds to our backyards, getting some of those hummingbirds in. We are joined today by Heather Diaz, who is a volunteer with the Master Gardener program, and she's going to tell us all about how to make that magic happen. Heather, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me and for making this happen, Lisa. So folks, if you didn't hear me before the program started, uh, you can type those questions into the chat box anytime during the program. I'll be keeping an eye on it throughout in the background while Heather's presenting, and then we'll have plenty of time for that Q&A at the end of the program. So get those questions in any time. Uh, don't be shy. I'll be keeping track of things there. And yeah, we are excited uh, to have everyone here. Heather, I'm gonna let you go ahead and take over the screen and get your program going. And I'm going to disappear into a cloud of uh, rain in the background and let you get the program on. So again, welcome everybody. And um, I'm so happy to be able to present to you on and share my knowledge of the magical um, world of hummingbirds and how to attract them to our gardens. So um, again, um, I'm a volunteer master gardener and this is uh, through the Extension Services, Hillsborough County Extension Services. Um, and we are educated by the University of Florida um, and uh, you may be familiar with UF IFAS. They have they offer so much um, information for us to uh, guide us in uh, our horticultural needs. Um, and uh, like uh, Lisa said, we're going to talk about attracting hummingbirds to our gardens. And this happens to be a wonderful uh, male ruby-throated hummingbird uh, feeding on a thistle. Um, so to, tonight, we're going to go over some general information um, on the hummingbirds, their behavior, nesting, their food needs, um, how to attract them to our garden, as well as uh, talk about you know, how we can supplement with feeders. And really it's more about using the feeders so that we can get a great look at them. Um, and we're gonna end with uh, a little bit on the banding research and then your Q and A. So let's get started. So in general, um, hummingbirds are only native to the Americas, North and South America. There's approximately over 300 species known. Um, again, you'll find that because they're so small, they're so fast, um, you know, identification can be quite difficult. Um, but again, the majority of uh, the hummingbirds in North America and South America more reside in Mexico and South America, but we are fortunate to have approximately 16 species and in the US that come to the US as well as three that are frequent to our Tampa Bay area. And uh, wow, look at that handsome devil. That is again, a, a male ruby-throated hummingbird. And uh, hummingbirds have iridescent feathers. The structure of their feathers um, allows for when sunlight hits them, they can be more vibrant than uh, when they're not, you know, in some sunlight. But uh, they are just magnificent in their their coloration and so unique for um, for uh, you know, a bird. But anyways, the size, the normal size um, of our ruby-throated hummingbird is about two and a half, three inches. But the range for multiple hummingbirds, uh, all the species, ranges from two inches to eight inches. Um, 
They have very, very high metabolism rates. Uh, you will see them flying around at jet speeds. <laughs> and, um, and as a result of that high metabolism, they will need to gain food from nectar and insects and so forth. They have a very soft vocalization, more of a chirp. Um, and once you hear that, you'll you'll hear it before you see them. Um, and it is not like a songbird. It is um, really alerts from the different hummingbirds that are saying, hey, this is my territory. You better get out of town because this is my territory. So um, they are solitary uh, other than when they breed. Um, and uh, they are very protective of their territory. The, so the smallest hummingbird is a resident of Cuba, and it is a bee hummingbird that's two inches. And the, the biggest one is called a giant hummingbird that is from Chile, and it's eight inches. So uh, again, they're just such an interesting uh, bird to, to learn about. Um, identification is difficult because they are still, even with the largest ones, the, the majority of them are around uh, three to uh, four inches and they are very small and they move so fast. So it's, and when they're female and they, and or juveniles, because the juvenile males don't really get their full color for for up to potentially two years. So again, uh, identification is tough, but um, they're just still so fascinating to to watch. So be patient, um, and I think that at towards the end of the program, Lisa's going to provide some library books that you can look. For um, and uh, have to gain even more uh, knowledge on. And um, so, you know, again, uh, just enjoy. So again, going on the whole aspect of identification, just realize that their behavior is more solitary other than when they breed. And um, so if you see a group of something that you think looks like a hummingbird, such as this in the picture, which happens to be a sphinx moth, and you'll see those, um, there'll be multiple of them usually at dusk, and uh, some people mistake them, and that's why they have a common name of hummingbird moth. But, you know, hummingbirds don't have antennas. They do not feed in groups. They fight each other over their territories. And so that wouldn't be the behavior of a hummingbird. So the most common hummingbird to our area is the ruby-throated hummingbird. And as we've seen the um, other pictures, the male has the ruby-throated throat and it has a little more uh, darker coloration. The female it does have a green back, um, but she tends to be more dull. And, um, and so that's how you can identify that that's female and that's male, um, but it is the same species. And of all of the hummingbirds that come to the Tampa Bay area, that's going to be your prevalent hummingbird. So these are migratory birds. And most of the hummingbirds species are migratory. Um, and the ruby-throated hummingbird, it migrates to breed in the eastern half of the United States. As you can see, the deep, the, the magenta, the purple is where their breeding grounds are. So just a little fact is, is that hummingbirds, wherever they were born, is where they're going to go back to continue to breed year after year. But the, ma the majority of the hummingbirds are migratory that come to the United States and the ruby-throated hummingbird will migrate 
um, back to its winter home, which would be in southern Mexico in Panama. And with their migrations, uh, and let me just go back once to uh, explain. So they come, um, oops, they come and migrate to come breed, and they'll come up from their winter homes in South Mexico, Panama, in the March uh, time frame, and then they'll go back to their winter homes in the October time frame. And we'll go over a little bit more of that in the next slide. Okay, so with migrations, um, you know, again, these birds, not only are they beautiful and they are just so energetic, so much um, energy, they are also are challenged with their migration paths every twice a year. So they travel, you know, some of them 4,000 um, 4, miles. But the biggest challenge is, is for them to migrate across the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions over the 15 years that I've talked on this topic as to, well, how did they accomplish that? when we know that they need to feed very frequently as, as much as every 15 minutes to keep up, you know, all of that flying around and, uh, and their high metabolism. Well, my understanding is, is when they do migrate across the Gulf of Mexico, of course, they're coming from their breeding grounds wherever they were born. And they come, they're going to go across the Gulf of Mexico and whether they're coming or they're going, they take several weeks to fatten up and they double in their fat weight uh, size um, in those few weeks before they're going to travel across the Gulf of Mexico. Now there is evidence that some do take the coast along the Gulf Coast um, to, to travel. But um, we know that any, any of the hummingbirds, the ruby-throated hummingbirds that come to Florida, most likely they are going to travel across the Gulf of Mexico. And they, and they do it not as a flock, they do it solo, even though they're, because of the timing of when they migrate, they migrate pretty much a lot within the same uh, month or so. And that's all instinctive upon that that bird. And, and it's part of the wonder of nature that they know where they're going. Um, so they even the juveniles, they were born wherever their their parents, uh, you know, had them up in the eastern half of the United States for the ruby throated hummingbird. And she only takes care of them for up to no more than 10 days after they get out of the nest. And they know where they're going to go and when they're going to go down to win their winter home. So, again, they choose when they're going to do it. And it typically is because of weather, instinct, and um, food sources as to when they go. Um, so, when do they go so that I know when to put out an, uh, some hummingbird feeders as well as to know, you know, when to watch for them. Uh, so they come from their winter home late February all the way to May. But here in the Tampa Bay area, my experience of seeing uh, those hummers is typically around the very beginning of March. And then they're about, the migrators are about done the middle of April, and I call it tax day. So tax day, you know, the majority of the migrators are gone. But just realize that we do have what we call resident uh, hummingbirds that have chosen to stay in the Tampa Bay area and breed. Um, so it is not, it, it's uncommon it's not as common as uh, North Florida all the way up to, you know, um, Canada that these birds go. 
but um, we do have them and um, I've talked to many locations within the Hillsborough County and the majority of all the locations do have Hummers that visit us all the way through the summer. And if you do have them outside of the migration time frame, that means you have and are lucky to have resident um, hummingbirds that have been that breed here in the area and will stay here until they go home to their winter home. So, so again, the males go first, then the females, and then the juveniles. When do they go back home to their winter home? They go, they start going July, the middle of July to through October. And again, in the Tampa Bay area, I find that I see them starting to migrate back in the August timeframe. And by October the 15th, I, I very rarely see any more. Um, so, so again, um, it's important to put out our feeders during those migration times for us to be able to really enjoy seeing them better. So again, ruby-throated hummingbirds are the most prevalent that come to our area, but we do have a couple, what I would call, um, winter residents. And they are the rufus, which you can see from the slide, hopefully. Um, and the rufus hummingbird will come uh, as one of the winter uh, hummingbirds to our area. And actually, it has the same migratory time frame as the ruby-throated, but the, the um, rufus breeds in the western half of the United States. The other resident that we have is the black chin. It looks very similar to the ruby-throated hummingbird, but it has a purple uh, throat for the male. And, um, and I, I feel that the if you see the black chin, it's a little bit smaller than the ruby-throated, um, but you'll see that it has the purple chin and kind of a little bit of black banding on uh, on its head. So these winter residents, these two, the rufus and the black chin, um, they're again on their migration path to warmer climates in the Mexico, South America territories. Um, but as they may be coming close to the Gulf uh, states because they're way they're on their way back and they do they too travel through the Gulf of Mexico um, if they don't go down the um, Mexican, you know, the Mexican uh, path. Um, you'll see Rufus, but again, very, that's, you're very lucky if you do see the Rufus or the Black Chin, but if you see them, it would most likely be in the August, September timeframe and the Black Chin in a little bit later October timeframe. So there are other hummingbirds that are very rare, that are spotted every once in a while, and these are some of them. Um, the Anna uh, hummingbird is uh, one that does not migrate, um, and it's tended to be seen more on the West Coast, the California uh, area, and it stays there uh, all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, Things, weather, uh, sources of food, and so forth, make uh, hummingbirds look look and, and travel around. So some fun fun facts is is that wow, their heartbeats, the hummingbird heartbeat, can be as great as 1,200 beats per minute. And you know what is humans like 80? <laughs> so. Their low heart rate is, is like tremendous compared to ours. And the even more phenomenal thing is, is that they're, when they're flying around, whether they're hovering, they're flying upside down, backwards, forwards, their wing rate uh, can be up to 200 beats per second. And, you know, that is one of the things that as you get more and more familiar with these magical creatures, you'll hear the wings 
before you see them. You'll hear their alert chirps before you see them. And, and it's something that you have to listen for. And and then boom, oh, here here's this magical creature um, looking and, and sharing my garden with them. So again, they have a unique wing structure that allows them uh, and the only bird that allows them to fly backwards, upside down, to hover, and uh, they can fly at speeds up to actually 80 miles an hour, um, but typically their speeds are 30 to 50 miles an hour, which is way fast enough. <laughs> so um, they're just amazing. So other behaviors is, is like I said, because of their high metabolism and, and all the energy it takes to expend in all their acrobats, they do need to feed frequently as much as uh, every 15 minutes. They cannot walk. They fly and perch to wherever they're going. And um, they have a specially uh, adapted tongue that is long and forked at the end that is very similar to straws. And uh, so that allows them to go in those tubular uh, flowers that they love the most because they probably they have the most amount of nectar in them and lap that up. Uh, you'll see and they feed heaviest at dawn and dusk because they go into a form of hibernation called tuber that they hibernate um, and lower their energy, uh, conserve their energy, but they stock up before they go to bed, and then when they get up, they're pretty hungry. So that's why you'll see them more frequently at your feeders in the morning and then in the evening or evening before it gets dark. So as I said, they're very fierce in protecting their territory. Males the most, um, females a little bit less, but again, they are solitary creatures uh, other than breeding, um, and uh, their songs are not like a songbird. They are singing, chirping to mark their territory and, and say, hey, uh, get out of my territory. This is mine, and they'll battle, they'll battle and battle uh, anybody that encroaches. They have extensive memories. They are creatures of habit, so it is known by the banding of uh, um, research that, and I've even noticed that um, they'll, I'll see uh, birds, uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird, that, that'll that come at the same times every year. Now, not being a bander, because they are licensed federally and by the state, uh, they'll know exactly that this bird came here where I am uh, capturing it to gather more research. But they know that it's very frequent that they come through the same yards, um, you know, every every time they're migrating through. So again, I said that the female is less territorial. And also, because she rears, she is responsible for choosing the mate and then also raising the young. Uh, the male does not help her. She builds the nest. She raises the young. Um, and, um, and so you might, if you are lucky to have resident uh, hummingbirds in your garden uh, through the summertime, you might notice that she becomes a little absent sometimes. And that's why she's just taking care of the young. And when she has the young, she's going to feed them more of uh, insects that are high protein versus the uh, soda pop until you know they're they're uh, out of the out of the nest. But here it is, here's a nest, and the penny gives you an idea of how small it is. It's just a walnut-sized nest. And um, the interior of, you can see the cottony type of material that's the inside, and that is plant material 
that she has gotten that's very downy. Um, and the exterior of it is is made by lichen and moss. And the interesting thing is, is that it's bound by spider webs. So um, we'll see if spiders are one of their predators. Uh, so the, the female will lay two eggs in one brew and they're about the size of jelly beans and uh, they will hatch in about uh, 15 to 20 days. And as I mentioned, the, the female uh, ruby-throated hummingbird brews up to two to three brews during the summer. So she's pretty, she's pretty uh, busy. So um, it takes them about 18 to 28 days to hatch, uh, I'm sorry, to um, be in the nest. And, um, one, and the, the mother fattens them up and they end up being double the size, uh, larger than the mother by the time they're ready to get out of the nest. And once they do get out of the nest, she only uh, keeps feeding them for, uh, you know, a week or so, not, not even very long. Um, and then they're on their own and um, she goes on to preparing the next brew. So you can see from this picture that those little babies are almost as big as mama. And um, again, the mother's source of primary food for her babies is insects, because that's going to be more protein to help them uh, build their fat and, and mature pretty quickly, as well as some nectar. So hummingbird feeder, or there's other sources of, um, of food, hummingbird feeders, tree sap, and occasionally fruit. And, you know, a lot of people are concerned that, oh, if I put hummingbird feeders out, that's going to change uh, their behavior and so forth. And that's, the, their studies have indicated that they're very instinctive as to their migration path, and um, and the feeders are only really going to attract them for us to benefit by being able to see them. So um, it's there's no harm there. So to attract them to our garden, you know, we have to provide them their food source. Um, we have to provide them shelter, safety. Uh, all the things that we as humans kind of need as a basic uh, uh, necessity. But um, so we need to provide them nectar source of food, which, you know, is going to be produced by many diverse flowers um, that they are attracted to. And uh, you'll, there's going to be a handout or there's going to be a link to um, an IFAS um publication that is um hummingbirds in in florida and it will provide you a list of some of the the plants that we recommend or ifas recommends but i'm also going to get to those slides of some of the recommendations um so brightly colored flowers they love reds oranges yellows um tubular is great and uh, that tends to those those types of um, plants and flower blooms tend to hold more nectar for them, which they love. Um, having a variety of these plants all year round that bloom, and we are so fortunate that we do have a long growing blooming season. Um, and then also putting out several feeders at least during their migration time frames or during while they're breeding if you have resident ones. So again, um, we want a variety of habitat. We want insects are very important for if you have um, hummingbirds that are breeding uh, and raising young. Uh, they, they need uh, water from um, misters are great, but you know we have a lot of rain, so um, they'll they'll get their water uh, in many ways. 
but also it's very, very important that we try to minimize, if not have any pesticides that will, you know, cause problems. And I've, again, talked over the years to many of the garden clubs, many of the library areas. And again, I find that and I happened to move from the Riverview Gibsonton area to South Tampa. And in Riverview Gibsonton, man, I had such a wonderful environment for the hummingbirds. They came, they were resident. Whereas in South Tampa, um, it's very, I ha they are here, but they're less frequent. And I, I kind of contribute that to that we probably use too much uh, pesticides, chemicals on our lawn and garden. So we need to try to help in um, if we want them to reduce those chemicals. So again, um, you know, their food source is nectar, um, and uh, the nectar is mostly for high energy. It does have some nutrients. Um, and uh, so again, insects are important too for their protein. So some suggested plants. Any there's a number of plants that I find they just love and they can't uh, resist. And one of them is firebush. And I call it there's a there's at least three with the fire word in their name. So firebush, fire spike, and there are two ver two varieties of fire spike. Sorry, I don't have a picture, but the fire spike is a, there's a red version, and then there is a purple pink um, version. And the red version, it, it blooms during the migration back to their winter homes in the fall, whereas the purpley pink uh, version of the fire spike, it blooms in the time that they're coming back to breed and in the spring. So it's a great plant to have as well as fires, um, um, firecracker. So the fire bush and the fire spike uh, tend to, to need some space. They're, they can be get fairly large, whereas the fire uh, cracker is more of a ground cover and uh, lower growing, but they're all reddish or red orange, and other than the purpley pink, um, that are more tubular and they love. Of course, the coral honeysuckle is a great option. So some trees. So flowering maple or a butylon is supposed to have, and it's a small tree typically, and it can have, my understanding, the most nectar in the base of its of this flower. Even though it's upside down, um, my understanding is, is it can hold the most nectar and the hummingbirds love it. Bottle brush is another great idea or option. Necklace pod, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but um, it is on the IFAS list to attract hummingbirds as well as hibiscus. Some more shrubs are a native coral bean, which um, just so you know, um, this is a native, but it does produce shiny red berries, which are poisonous. So if you do have children or think parties that might eat that, you just beware. Uh, powder puff is another um, good, good option for a large shrub to almost a mini tree. So perennials, um, penta, salvia, and this salvia picture is, um, there's many varieties of salvia and realize that scarlet um, salvia, salvia coccinia is a native and it is the bullet uh, uh, attractor. Um, my first uh, experience of seeing a hummingbird on a plant in my garden many years ago was on a scarlet uh, 
salvia, um, salvia coccinea, uh, the native, and you can get those in at some of the uh, plant festivals, the USF plant festival. Usually there's vendors that will have that. Um, you can get it at Tampa Green Fest that's coming up in March of next year. You can get it at any of the um, native plant nurseries in the area. So, you know, again, we want to have flowers, plants that are flowering all year round to try to attract and and uh, the hummingbirds to our garden. So, you know, we're again so fortunate to have a long blooming season of of a variety of plants. And um, but you know, in the winter time, sometimes uh, we need annuals to supplement. And uh, here are a couple that you can uh, that are suggested. So to recap, we want lots of flowers that are blooming year round, diverse uh, environment, lots of insects uh, for them. And the insects that they mostly uh, use or eat will be more of your smaller gnats, um, fruit gnats, things like that. Um, and you can go out online and uh, Google. There's many different hummingbird uh, elaborate um, videos, magic in the sky, different things like that, that show you um, these magical creatures uh, feeding on gnats, midair and so forth. Um, so putting out feeders, at least when they're migrating and they're in your area um, and giving them structure cover, you know, trees, shrubs. And we're just, again, so fortunate to have a great tree canopy that will help um, give you the environment that they like so they can scurry away and make sure that they are not um, threatened and endangered by uh, predators. So talking about predators, <laughs> um, so we have, you know, they have a laundry list of predators that uh, they have to, to deal with and the challenges. Um, and, you know, we, and again, and we talked about, oh, well, you know, they bind their nests with spider web. Well, here in Florida, I know the banana spider webs are pretty, pretty huge. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I just think that there's a possibility that some of the, the spider webs that they're trying to use, they could by mistake get caught up in, in, uh, in, in their webs. But uh, it also is known that um, there was a big mouth bass that a fisherman caught and uh, was cleaning it and discovered a hummingbird in its in its gut. And, you know, so they're small, they're they look like insects. And, you know, that's what fish and and frogs and stuff feed on. But um, but again, we have to also realize that we, us humans can also contribute to their mortality. And that is, is that we have, you know, um, large windows uh, that we want to keep feeders away from those windows. Because again, these are very territorial uh, birds and they'll see themselves in the window as a mirror and they'll go crashing into them. Um, also, we may have flowering plants in our screened lanai's or pool cages, and they're going to be attracted and they're going to go right into the screen. And um, it's been known that they have been caught with their beaks in the uh, screens. And, um, you know, because they need to feed frequently, they could perish. So just when it's migration time and you have them around, uh, be aware of, of those different challenges that, that, that they have. So feeders. So just to, to give you my recommendation, this is a common uh, feeder that um, you can see the yellow is what's called a bee guard. It keeps your wasps and your bees because they feed on sugar water, just like the hummingbirds. 
And if you don't have a bee guard, you will have where the bees and the wasps will get into the the sugar water and spoil it sooner than you would want. Um, there, the other nice thing about this is is that they make ones that have the plastic tank, but they also have ones that have the glass tank. The plastic tanks work fine, but they're going to um, not last as long. Uh, and the glass ones will last quite a, quite many years and it makes it, um, I think, much easier to clean them. Um, you want to have, if you can have multiple feeders, that's great. Having them at uh, different eye levels, meaning that um, if you have them at the same line of sight, then the same uh, male ruby-throated hummingbird is going to say, hey, both of those feeders are mine, and he will fight them all day long to keep them his. Um, so by putting them at different levels of eye sight line, um, you and then different locations, you can have multiple and hopefully more than one will uh, be able to come to it. Um, you also want to keep it in a shady location in our hot summers um, or, you know, uh, our hot time frames for two reasons. One, uh, by having the sugar water in the full sun, it's going to go rancid and bad sooner. Um, than if it was in the shade. Two is, is if it's in the shade, that means you have some kind of structure, tree, shrub, that is going to be protective and make the hummingbird feel more secure that if they need to go um, and quickly get away, they can. And you do, you again, as I mentioned, you don't want to put these feeders by your windows where they can crash into them. You don't want to um, have them uh, where it, they're going to to um, be too low, where a cat can come by and be a you know uh, end it, end themselves. But um, again, there's many models of bird feeders. This one happens to not have the bee guards, which are okay. But again. We have a lot of pollinators and they will like this sugar water just as much and they will get in and and uh, cause cause it to go rancid faster. Um, the and I also find that the smaller, the better, the the simpler, the better. But some of these beautiful um, uh, glass blown uh, feeders are gorgeous and I have I have some but they tend to not be as practical for being the feeders uh, also the ones that have um, that are hanging tube feeders they tend to leak a lot so again uh, as I mentioned I really like this one one of the ones that's my favorite um, and the perch can be adjusted, removed, so that you can see um, whether you want to see it hovering or you want to see it perched. It gives you that option. So this feeder, again, doesn't have the bee guards, um, and but it does have what's called an ant guard. So this little red uh, container up at the top holds a oh, uh, water in it and becomes like a moat so that it prevents the ants from climbing down and getting into your water. Um, so to go over how to make the the sugar water, the nectar for the hummingbird feeders, um, it is as simple as four parts water to one part granular sugar. Never use honey. Honey has natural bacteria that can harm um, the hummingbirds, you only want to use granular white sugar. Um, you know, commercials are available, but I find that it's most economical and easy to do. Uh, and I make less 
less is better than filling up your whole uh, your whole tank with sugar water. We don't have that many coming, many hummingbirds coming to feed, and it will go rancid, and we have to change it every three three to five days, depending on the heat of the weather. Um, so just I I just take and make uh, put a quarter cup of sugar in a, a glass measuring cup. I fill up the measuring cup to one and a quarter of um, amount, put it in the microwave, get it close to boiling, and uh, make sure that the sugar is all dissolved and then let it cool, whether you put it in your refrigerator or whether you let it stand um, on the counter and let it cool before you put it in to your, your feeders and then distribute them out. Um, no coloring is necessary. They will come, they will find it. Um, so here's another, one of my favorite types of uh, feeders. This one happens to have the, the plastic tank and that's fine, it just won't last as long. And this happens to be a homemade ant guard. If you've ever had the uh, cinnamon rolls, uh, they come with a frosting cup that looks like that. You can reuse that, um, put, a, um, put a hole through to have, have a hanger and then uh, caulk it with uh, clear silicon and you've got your, you got your own uh, homemade ant guard. But really the ant guard and buying ones with the bee guards, the ant guards are very economical um, and they're worth the investment to keep the ants from uh, spoiling your nectar. Um, again, you need to uh, replace the sugar water every three to five days. So don't fill it up and waste it. Just put in, you know, a little bit and um, and put it in multiple feeders and uh, then you'll have multiple areas to watch these magical creatures. You do want to clean them with water. Um, I clean them every time that I replace the sugar water. Um, I, you never use soap. Um, you use uh, a vinegar mixture. Um, and it, it'll be depending on the weather as to how you know, um, moldy they get and so forth. Usually the bee guards are, can be taken off. That's typically where some of the grunge starts to build up. Um, and uh, again, wa water, clean water to clean them out. Um, and then, you know, as they, they uh, are used more and more, you'll every once in a while need to use the, the vinegar to, and then a and then scrub out the 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 uh, algae and so forth. Um, you know, again, the more you have them out, uh, at least when they're around, the more you're going to attract them. So you know, you don't need a huge yard. You can have a small space and still enjoy them. Here's um, Steve Bax is um, a resident uh, expert and we'll talk about his contributions and his Facebook page. But before he moved to his home in Valrico, this was his uh, his apartment and he had gobs of um, of nectar supplying uh, food, flowers, for the hummers and you can see there's hummingbird feeders and they're mixed in it all. And um, so, you know, just having uh, an apartment balcony, you can do it. So again, we want flowers, flowers, flowers to feed and insects. We want plant diversification, habitat diversification, and they will definitely come. So you know, sit back, enjoy, um, minimize, if not eliminate your pesticides, have 
multiple feeders and uh, enjoy the magic. So I think we're going to next talk about the branding research. So um, the banding research for birds, um, including hummingbirds, uh, is done through the Department of Interior, U.S. Geological Survey, and you do have to be federally and state licensed to um, do the banding, and it is great information for understanding more about that species of bird, their movements, their survival rates, uh, their health. Um, and um, so, you know, again, it's um, an amazing program. And we are lucky to have, uh, we're one of the banders, and we'll get into that next, comes to Steve's home in Valrico usually once or twice a year. And he posts when that is happening on the Facebook page. Uh, and um, but anyways, here's some of the tools that are used. And this little safety pin has a bunch of little um, of the bands that are put onto the tiny birds. And um, and then next, he um, he catches the birds by putting out a feeder. And over the feeder is a net. And when the bird comes to feed, the, the net comes down, not harming the bird. And then they do all of their recording of weight. They, they determine, does this bird already have a band? They record uh, all the information that they need. And after they're done with that, they put a little tiny piece of um, temporary paint on its head that's non-harmful, and that allows them to know that they already recorded everything they need to on that bird, because that bird's going to go back to that feeder again for the next few days, and um, and so they don't want to have to repeatedly catch the bird, um, and they go on to only catching the ones that come without that paint. So it's a very fascinating uh, experience, and. Um, if you're more interested, I would recommend uh, joining the Facebook group. And that Facebook group is um, Hummingbirds in Florida. And Steve Banks is Bax is the um, is the proprietor on that. Um, so Heather, if you would it, it, for that contact information, I will have that in the link that we drop later on. Very good. And um, so this what he used to have in it still exists. Hummingbird, uh, Florida hummingbirds dot proboards dot com. Um, but it's not with Facebook. Um, it's so much more uh, useful to to join that group called um, Hummingbirds in Florida and and then you you'll see people that post to it that post questions on hummingbirds for our area. They'll also post sightings of hummingbirds. And it's very exciting to see, oh gosh, just right down the road, um, there was a sighting of this and this. So I highly recommend it. Um, Fred Bassett is the, um, the bander that comes and he's licensed federally as well as he's licensed to do banding in Alabama. Florida and Idaho. And just so you know, is, is Alabama, um, there's a Saint uh, Fort um, Monroe, uh, Alabama is right on the coast. And it is uh, a very much of a favorite spot for a lot of the ruby throated hummingbirds to come to when they're going back to their winter home and uh, they congregate coming through there and fattening up. And uh, so it's interesting that he's uh, a bander in Alabama yeah. where there's going to be a lot of birds going through. And I think that we are ready for questions. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and get our contact slide up here for everyone. 
So I am going to start adding a few links to our chat box so that you have all of that on hand. And then we will start getting to the Q&A. So if you have not yet, definitely go ahead and get those questions into the chat box so that we can answer them during the Q&A. It's always wonderful when we can share those while we're live on the program. That way, everybody who's here has the benefit of hearing the answers to your questions. And I can guarantee you that your question is not going to be sillier than mine, so don't be shy. Go ahead and get those questions in so that we can get to them. While you're typing those questions in, I'll tell you about two books that I found that might be handy for you that I found uh, as ebooks that you can check out with your library card. One is The Art of Hummingbird Gardening, and the other one is Attracting and Feeding Hummingbirds. So while the library has tons of books on hummingbirds and uh, pollinators and all of that, uh, I know that I'm sometimes too impatient to wait to get to the library to pick up that physical book. So sometimes I want to be able to look up that thing right now and jump right in with my research. This is a really easy way to do it. If you already have the Hoopla app installed uh, and you're logged in with your library card, you can just browse, just type in Hummingbird. These were one of the on the one of the top pages of results that I got there. Uh, and if you uh, don't have that Hoopla app installed yet, you can go to hcplc.org slash ebooks. They have uh, the ability to use it on your desktop computer laptop. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, there's apps for, for pretty much any option and it is free with your library card. So check that out. And I see we have some questions coming in. Awesome, I'm excited for those. If you uh, need to jump off, I know we're wrapping up a little bit later than planned. I apologize for those technical gremlins that we had earlier. Uh, so if you need to jump off before we can finish the Q&A, you can always follow up with us at hcplc.org slash contact or give us a call 813-273-3652. The Hillsborough Master Gardener Help Desk uh, information is up there on the screen. Their phone and email, they are so awesome at answering questions of all kinds. So don't be shy. They are so great for helping us out with those. So check those out. All right, I'm going to start reading some questions that have come in, Heather, okay? Sure, so we had a number of people that were really excited about this program. They mentioned how, how they were inspired by it, and they're uh, inspired to uh, start trying to attract some of those small, mighty hummingbirds to their gardens and have already seen some results. So that is so awesome, and we love to see that. And it looks like the first question we have here is, what are the dangers of hummingbird feeders if people don't clean them regularly? That's a right. very good question. It is, it is. So if we don't clean uh, the sugar water after the, you know, the three to five days, um, bacteria builds up into them and it gets contaminated and uh, rancid. And um, so the hummingbirds will go and they'll go, oh, this is not good. And they won't drink from it. Um, they might potentially and they would get sick. But um, what's going to be the long lasting effect is, is that if you don't do that, you're not going to attract the hummingbirds to the feeders. They're, they're smart. They know and they won't come back. So you do need to keep them clean. Wonderful. So we don't have a ton of questions coming in here yet. So keep them coming, folks. So. I remember you showed us a couple of different kinds of hummingbirds that come through the area. So I am going to scroll back through the slides because I know we had some issues with folks not being able to see things in the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get a couple of these earlier pictures pulled up uh, while folks are typing in. Uh, the next question that has come in in the meantime is, do hummingbirds appear year round or are they seasonal? Uh, they're looking for the migration periods when they might see some of them. Sure. Again, the ones that come to our area, which is uh, mostly the ruby-throated hummingbird, is a migratory hummingbird. 
and it will come here during the warm season. It will come up from his winter, him and his and her winter homes from South Mexico and uh, Panama area, and they will migrate up starting in, you'll see them here in the Tampa Bay area starting in March. And I, I see them March to what I call tax day, about April 15th. But realize that you can have resident hummingbirds. Those are the ones that were born here in the Tampa Bay area. And so they were always going to come back to breed in wherever they were born. So you could have them all the way until they go back to their winter home in the, um, I would say, the late, the, the August to the October time frame. And But then they are also seeing that there are some that because of our warmer climate here in Florida, they could actually be here year round, but they tend to be, they are mostly migratory. And uh, so those are the times that you want to look for them. Oh, and one other thing is, is I will be doing this program, this presentation at Tampa Green Fest. And Tampa Green Fest is um, at the Tampa Garden Club off of Bayshore this next year when they have their, their festival, March 9th and 10th. I will be doing this live and in person at Tampa Green Fest on the 10th in the morning. Hope to see you. Awesome. So we had somebody that's asking if they were able to get a PDF of the slideshow. Um, we don't have that, but we do have the handout, uh, the IFAS handout. So I've added the link to the chat box for that, but we don't have the whole slideshow available as a download. And whenever you have um, interest in a topic and you want to get very good information from the University of Florida, IFAS, all you need to do is, is when you're searching online, put in UF. IFAS, I-F-A-S, in the topic. So if you put in U-F-I-F-A-S hummingbirds, you're going to get all of the information that is publications from the University of Florida. And the if you see that email address up on the screen here, I know they're always very helpful about if I am just running into a wall and not doing a not finding what I'm looking for, just doing the regular searches. I've reached out to them by the this email address here on the hillsmg at ad.ufl.edu. And I, they have sent me directly links to the stuff that I was looking for that was really helpful to get that information as well. All right, so I think we've caught up on our questions. If I have missed your question, please uh, do that little raisey hand button and I will do a quick double check, but I believe we have gotten all of the open questions. Well, it was very much a pleasure and uh, we hope that you will learn and take this uh, and execute it to try to attract hummingbirds to your garden and enjoy um, the magic. I'm always excited to bring some more in. I love that I can always hear them before I see them when I'm out in the garden. Uh, so folks, if you are looking for other Master Gardener programs, we have uh, our link up on the screen to the library calendar, hcplc.org slash events. If you're on our main calendar, the library calendar, if you just type in the word Master Gardener, that's going to pull up all of our events at library branches and online. So you can see what's, what's already up there right now. Uh, do a quick search that way, see if there's something at a branch near you. And we hope to see you back for that. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the chat here in case any last minute questions come in so that I can forward them. If you have a moment before you head out, let's see if we can get our uh, how are we doing poll going. Uh, so I've got that launched here. So if you don't mind, just let us know how we're doing on these programs, uh, what you learned, what you would like to learn. 
uh, let us know. We would love to, to hear back from you. Heather, thank you so much for this great program. I always love our Master Gardener programs. They're always a fun way to reconnect with what's going on outside in our gardens. My, my pleasure. All right, folks, I hope you have a good evening. And again, this program will be posted on the library's YouTube channel soon, usually within a week or so of the program. If you're looking for that, it is youtube.com slash Tampa Hills Live. And I'm going to add that to our chat right now in case anybody wants to copy paste that. That is the library's YouTube channel uh, under the playlist feature. If you go to that, we do have a whole playlist just for our Master Gardener programs. So you can catch up on previous episodes there anytime. And with that, I'll wish everyone a good evening. Thank you for joining and we will see you back soon. Good night, everyone. Good night.